look at Exodus chapter 20 again, and I'll be if we could be hold of the chapter relative to the Ten Commandments here. Uh, the whole Bible, as we just learned, is relative to the Ten Commandments. But I want to read to you verses 1 through 21. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoked. The people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. The people stood far off, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this revelation of your law. It is righteousness through and through. We do acknowledge our own sinfulness and how we have fallen far short of these uh, wonderful and perfect standards. We pray, Lord, that as we meditate on the Tenth Commandment today, that your Spirit would bless it to our hearts, that you would show us the glory of Jesus, who fulfills the law for us, that we might be saved, and who indeed endures the penalty of violating the law in our place, so that our guilt might be removed, our sins covered. We thank you, O Lord, for this wonderful mediator, Jesus, who atones for us, and we pray that your spirit, the spirit of Jesus, would enable us and empower us this day and ongoing to obey him by obeying your law. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may recently have received a check or two or three or four from your federal government or state government. First it was a check for $1,400, and then a check for $600 a person, and then maybe a couple more as well. And you thought, where did this money come from? Does it grow on trees? 
Who knows where it comes from? Well, it's from the government who's able to print money for you. And they can print as much as they want. And so they distributed all this money. Now, it could be argued that we were in an emergency. People, the economy was shut down, there were lockdowns, and people's businesses were being closed for a period of time. Indeed, that period of time extended a bit longer than I think most of us would have liked. But what was the uh, underlying game involved in this distribution of money from the federal government? It may have been the benefit of helping those who are in need. But at the same time, while the government seems to be generous and compassionate in this way, we, see, we now see the consequences of that big rush of money into people's pockets. With the constraints on the economy in terms of its supply, people not working, so they're not producing goods and services, so the supply of goods and services is constrained. You have all this money coming into people's pockets and a pent-up demand to purchase things which are not available. We know about the supply chain crisis, uh, the, the cost increase of fuel, um, and we can talk about that, the reasons for that. But uh, you have a, a diminished supply and an increased demand. And if you know anything about economics, supply and demand are what our economy runs on. And so when the supply is plentiful, prices are less. You can buy any kind of thing. When there's a minimum supply, then the prices go up. Same thing. Demand goes up, there's not sufficient supply, then there's a lot of dollars chasing too few goods. And so you have an increase in the price of goods. So we're now facing inflation. That $1,400 check you receive is now going to the gas station when you pay your fill up your tank. It's going to the grocery store when uh, the price of your, your food bill is going up. All these kinds of things come into play. One writer says that actually what is happening here is a great transfer of wealth from the middle class and the poor to the elite, to the rich to the big companies and so forth, and to the government. It's kind of a, a, a trick that they're playing. They give you something on one hand, and you think, wow, wonderful. But at the same time, that's going to come right back to them in terms of higher prices for goods and services that the, the wealthy companies are going to uh, reap for themselves. Now, there can be all kinds of arguments about that. But he was saying that this was a way in which the wealthier classes are putting the squeeze on the middle class and the poor. And certainly the things that the middle class and the poor depend on, food prices, energy prices, are very much at the heart of our existence. And when you don't have a job as well, then that can be quite a, a challenge. So, Covetousness. We often think of that in terms of perhaps looking at your neighbor and thinking, my, my neighbor has a, a wonderful car, I wish that I had that car. Um, and, and then perhaps you even go towards the, the thought of stealing that car from him. That might not work out too well, but that's the, the, the direction that covetousness goes uh, uh, among ourselves. But we see on a grand scale how covetousness can be at work in an economy. The wealthy are not satisfied with all their wealth. They want more. And they look at the middle class, and they want to strip the middle class. So you have in society this bifurcation of the extreme wealthy, and then everybody's slipping down into the poorer classes and dependent upon government for support. What I'm describing for you is a kind of socialism is at work in our culture today. A redistribution of wealth organized by the government, but in cooperation with uh, companies that are favored by the government to their own benefit. Actually, it, it hurts them. 
But in any case, the, the command here that we're giving to us is you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Or his manservant, maidservant, ox or donkey. I haven't coveted someone's ox or donkey in quite a while, <laughs> I must confess. <laughs> Obviously, these are just examples which are relevant to that day. But today, the ox might be a, a, a tractor, it might be a, a truck, it might be all kinds of things. Maybe a, 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 a machine shop or something like that. Um, all kinds of ways in which that can apply to, to folks today. The, the, the first command with regard to you shall not cover your house may be a general statement which you have at the very end as well, or anything that is your neighbor's. And after saying the house, he specifies the kinds of things that are in a person's house, his wife, his kids, his servants, his uh, possessions, and so forth. In any case, nothing that belongs to your neighbor should be coveted by you. You should refrain from that kind of thing. Now, what does it mean to covet? That's the key question, isn't it? Um, first of all, we might make this observation. When we come to the Ten Commandments, and the, the intent of the Ten Commandments has to do with coveting, we might think, well, that's a rather anticlimactic close to these Ten Commandments. You shall not have any other gods besides me. Do not bow down to or worship uh, idols and so forth. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Um, honor your father and your mother. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. All these things, big ticket items. And at the end is, oh, then don't covet. Now, we don't always know what's going on in somebody's heart. So I can't tell if, you know, if somebody around me is coveting or not. That's something that occurs inside. It's an internal thing. And so why does the, commandment, the Ten Commandments end with this? Some say maybe it would have been better if Moses began the Ten Commandments with coveting, start off with the small stuff, and build up to the big stuff at the end. Have a big bang at the end. But actually there's a purpose for this. It reminds us that the law is spiritual. And we should not be simply going through these Ten Commandments and looking at them outwardly as to what they require. And then think that, well, I've done okay in life. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen. I haven't well, I have broken the Sabbath day, so maybe I've worked a time or two on the Lord's day. But we look at the Ten Commandments, and sometimes we are tempted to just look at them on the surface of things and not consider how they address the heart. This final commandment reminds us that the law is spiritual. It addresses the heart, the inner motivations of life. Remember the Apostle Paul, who once was a Pharisee, who is very particular about his obedience to the law, who observed all the standards, the, the rituals, all the traditions of the elders and so forth, very, very particular about obeying the law. He said that when he came to this 10th commandment, suddenly he realized he was a guilty man. All kinds of sin was at work within his heart. And so, whereas he, he didn't commit adultery, he didn't steal anyone's gold or what have you, nonetheless there was the covenant within. And here he realized he was a great sinner. This is the thing that we need to understand about the law of God. It addresses the heart. God requires perfection through and through. Not really in the outward conduct, but the things that you think about, the beliefs you hold to, the thoughts you entertain, the desires that you have, passions, the, the choices you make, all these things within the heart, the soul, they too come under God's inspection. Remember Jesus in talking with Pharisees who got upset with the disciples because they were walking through the fields and they were eating food, excuse me, they were at, uh, excuse me, at somebody's home, and the disciples just started eating right away. But the Pharisees, 
as was their ritual, they would wash their hands and go through all different kinds of ablutions so that they could be ceremonially clean and then prepared to eat the food before them. Disciples just dug in. Jesus said, it's not what comes from the outside in that corrupts us and pollutes us, like the food that we eat or what have you, and so we declare all foods clean. It's what arises from within, from the heart, that pollutes us. And he mentions a wide variety of sins rooted here in the Ten Commandments. Murder, adultery, covetousness, envy, strife, all these kinds of things arise from within the heart. It's that which corrupts us and makes us guilty before God, first of all. And so if you read the Ten Commandments aright, you see this is the grand climax. Because whereas we thought we could skate by a few things here and there, the bottom line is God requires that your heart be pure before Him. Jesus said you must be perfect even as your Heavenly Father is perfect. The writer to the Hebrews talks about the Word of God and says it is living and active like a two-edged sword. It's able to pierce and divide between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. There's nothing that does not come into view in the eyes of the Word of God. There are no secrets. God knows every little bit about us. Now, can you say with the Apostle Paul, I'm undone. I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. Washing, cleansing. I need a righteousness that I don't have, I can't attain to on my own. There's no one here who can so discipline their thoughts, their feelings, and desires that they never sin within. They'll get angry. Don't feel hatred. Uh, don't... Um, be jealous, envious, what have you. All these things percolate within. They don't always come to the surface, but they're there inside. We need to be cleansed inwardly. The psalmist says in Psalm 130, O Lord, who could stand if you should remember our sins? There's none righteous, Paul says. No, not one. I mean, even our belief systems that we have in our mind come under God's review. And if you have wrong thoughts about God, wrong thoughts about the way of salvation, about the scriptures, you're guilty. So, God looks within. Coveting is a desire, but there are proper desires. It's appropriate to wish to improve your life, to advance in life, to get a degree, to find a better job, uh, to make a better income, uh, provide better for your family. All these things are well and good. It's good to desire marriage, a, a wife or a husband. It's good to pursue these kinds of things. It's good to have a sexual desire appropriately for a wife or husband. These things are good. Desire itself is not sinful. The problem is, first, what is being desired, which is that which belongs to somebody else, and then secondly, the fact that you wish to attain that. You begin to fixate on that one thing, and you plan to find a way to get that for yourself. I think it was the prophet Micah who talked about how people in the second chapter devise on their beds what they could obtain from the poor in particular. And then during the day, because it was in their power to do so, they did it. Micah was a prophet and he spoke out against the abuses that the rich had of the poor and the way they oppressed the poor. And they come up with all kinds of schemes that would trap the poor Kind of like China and the Belt and Road scheme where they come into a country and they, they uh, give them financing for this project and that project and then they become indebted to China and now China has them and they can tell them what to do. Maybe that's where China has us at this moment. Um, 
So, with covetousness, there's a desire for something that doesn't belong to us, it belongs to somebody else, and a, a fixation on it such that you want to possess it, you plan to possess it, take that for yourself. That's covetousness. And it can be expressed in a wide variety of ways. Uh, envy is a kind of covetousness. It's looking at somebody else who is more prosperous than you, perhaps, who's doing better than you. And this is uh, what, what happens within a socialist economy. Envy looks at those who are rich, the wealthy. The richest 1% who are not paying their fair share. You've heard that before. And it's saying that they have something that I don't have, I want it, or I'm not happy that they have it, and so we'll tax the rich. We'll use the government to be the thief, to plunder the rich, and redistribute their wealth to us. Right? There are different ways in which covetousness and envy can work itself out. It's not necessarily by me personally directly picking someone's pocket. I can have somebody do it for me. I can vote for politicians who will vote for all kinds of things. So be careful of covetousness and envy. Envy not only desires things, but then it seeks the destruction of the other person and the possessions that they have. If I can't, can't have it, then you can't have it, and I don't care what happens as a result. And so you have, in 2020, riots taking place. What are they doing? Breaking into businesses, taking out, stealing from the rich, burning businesses down. How did that help the community? How did it help anyone? It destroys businesses, takes away jobs. People no longer have those businesses to go to when they need products and services. How does that help anybody? It's envy which seeks to destroy. I don't have it. You've got it. Neither of us are going to have it. I'm going to burn you down. That's what's happening throughout our country in different ways. Rather than being filled with covetousness and envy and these kinds of feelings, scriptures point us in a different direction. Positively, we ought to be content with that which God has given to us in life. Contentment is a rare jewel whereby I am happy with where I'm at. Doesn't mean that I might not be interested in improving my situation here and there, but I'm happy with that which God has given to me now at this point in my life. I'm thankful. There's a certain richness and wealth in that ability to be content. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 4 says that I've learned to be the secret of contentment. Be content whether I have many things or very few things. He says I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He's content with God's provision. And he realizes that God can provide for him in every circumstance of life. You see, contentment recognizes that God is sovereign and by his providence he rules all things. I'm blessed with, a, a, I think, a, a lovely home, a car or two, or three, or four. Um, I'm blessed in many ways. I'm very simple. A trombone. I'm blessed in many ways. But I can always think of ways in which I could be better blessed. <laughs> Other things that I'd like to have. I have to learn to rest in that which God has given me and rejoice in them. God is good. He's blessed me. I have all that I need. Jesus counsels us when we look at uh, the things of this life and the pressures of life, particularly you've got inflation running and there'll be food scarcity in the fall. There will be mass, the converted will be mass starvation in the winter and into next year if those crane 
Ukraine grain shipments don't make it to the Middle East. You're talking about millions of people starving. It's a massive, massive problem. Um, Jesus says to his church, not to be worried about these kinds of things. What shall I eat? What shall I wear? God knows that you have need of these things. And so when we look at the world, we interpret it and we, we make our deductions, our extrapolations, and we think this is the way it's going to turn out. And quite a lot of things may go that way. But there are many ways in which God can work through history and time and surprise you. Do things which you didn't expect, but somehow God provided for you. Jesus says, seek first God's kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Let your mind be filled with the glory of Christ, the work, the riches of his salvation, the fact that you are forgiven of sin, you have his righteousness covering you, you have the hope of eternal life in a new heavens and a new earth. You know that this world is passing away. You know that you're going to die. At some point, there's nothing that you have right now that's going to be yours. Jesus tells a story of the rich man who has all these barns and he's got crops going all over the place and he's got to build bigger barns. So what shall I do? I'll build a bigger barn and I'll have plenty and I'll be able to sit back and relax the rest of my life. What happens in the story? Well, God says to him, you fool! This day I will require your soul. And then what will become of your barns and all your plenty will be given to others. We don't have a guarantee about today, let alone tomorrow or the next day in terms of our life. We're passing through this world. It might be brief, it might be long, but we're passing through this world. There's a better world to come. There's a kingdom to come. And the church values that age above this present age. We fix our eyes on that blessed hope. And so when we think about food shortages, economic worries, my job, uh, is somebody going to take my house? You know, there are all kinds of ways and schemes by which people take your house now by taking your title. Scary stuff. Sweat the details. Rest of the Lord's provision for you for the future. And realize that He has control of history and time. He will take care of you, provide for you in this life as well, according to His will, and bring you safely to that eternal city. Trust in Him. All of us covet. A lot of us struggle to be content. Jesus is one who never coveted. First, he owns everything. <laughs> there's, he's God, so there's nothing that he needs from us. He owns it all. He never covets. His heart is pure. You look through the Psalms and you read through the Psalms, it's the Spirit of Christ speaking in the Psalms. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Who among us can say that with full confidence? We love Scripture. We meditate on it from time to time. Only Jesus fulfills that. Jesus said to the people of this day, which of you convicts me of sin? It's much like the Apostle Paul when he spoke with the Ephesian elders. He says, whose gold or silver did I covet? Did I take? Yeah. He lived a, a, a godly life among his people. Jesus is the one who fulfills that law for us perfectly. And it's his perfect spirit, his perfect heart. That righteousness that's imputed to you through faith. That's what you need. A perfect, through and through righteousness. And that's what he offers you as a free gift. If you believe in him, if you commit your
yourself to Him and receive that free gift. And with that is everlasting life forever and ever. Seek first His kingdom of righteousness. Don't sweat the details. All these other things will be provided for you. Trust in the Lord. And you will do it. That's right. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And we pray that you would comfort us in the midst of the struggles and tensions and strife of life. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to rest in you and your faithful provision for us. Help us to look to Jesus, who fulfills your law perfectly on our behalf, who intercedes for us, having been tempted and yet never sinned. Help us, O Lord, to overcome the desires of covetousness and envy, jealousy and strife. Help us, O Lord, to walk in uh, lives of righteousness, peace, and contentment. We ask in Jesus' name.